paper is everywhere in our lives. It's a multitasking material. But sometimes people take it for granted. Well, I'm a paper supporter and I want to open everyone's eyes. I don't want you to miss this. Finding out stories from the past. Wow, look at that. Here it is. I'm goosebumps. The present. That is what I call a machine. This place can make 16,000 of those every single minute. And the future of this amazing invention. The first media revolution. I'm Tim Shaw, and this is my personal journey into paper. I'm going to test drive that one. <laughs>the modern world in which we live it's busy it's frantic it's hectic it's information overload it's, it's a global storm of binary code zeros and ones flying everywhere at the speed of light you know it yourself texts beeps vibrations buzzes all the time non-stop i mean there's always someone to flirt with there's always someone to call there's always some research to do but have we not become too dependent on technology excuse me do you know where whitworth street is please i don't sorry. whitworth street anyone they're all thinking, you're a stupid man. Why don't you just reach for your smartphone? But are we missing something here? Many people think that paper is now just a useless material, something that just keeps being replaced by new technology. I mean, who needs paper when we have tablets and smartphones and readers and laptops? Will paper soon vanish from planet Earth? 60 million years from now, will they talk about paper as we talk about dinosaurs. Well, I've got my own opinion on that one, actually, but I want to know what other people think first. Excuse me, guys, can I ask you a question? Very quickly, right? Would you rather get rid of the technology in your life or paper? Paper. Paper. Paper, definitely. Hmm, good question. Paper. Paper. Do you think paper's just kind of obsolete? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think so. Paper. Yeah. You can do things so much quicker. Paper. Paper. Fields. Paper for sure. Paper. You'd rather lose paper? Yeah, well, it's no-brainer. It's all in here. I can't help but think that all these people here, all these anti-paper people, are just so far off the mark. They've got it so wrong. I mean, surely a world without paper would be a, would be a sad place to be, right? Well, I'm taking a stand, and I'm siding with paper. My background is engineering and inventing, so I admit technology is super useful. But the truth be known, I choose paper every time. I mean, I love handwritten letters, I love books, I love magazines and newspapers. In fact, I would say that all my emotions still travel by paper, even if there is a technological equivalent for all of these things. But you know what? Sometimes paper is truly irreplaceable. I'm going on a journey into the world of paper. And guess what? I'm going to keep a paper diary of my adventure. When I return, I'll give it to my daughter. She's just a little thing at 11 years old, but when she grows up, I really wanted to know that paper is the future. My journey begins here in Salisbury in England, my home country. Now, you might be wondering, what has this place got to do with paper? So this is Salisbury Cathedral. It's one hell of an impressive building, isn't it? That spire up there is actually 123 metres high. That's the highest spire in the UK. But as impressive as that is, this is about paper. And it's what's inside there which is so important to our democracy and our freedom today that I want to see. In fact, in my humble Englishman's opinion, 
It's more important than the Ten Commandments. And it's what it's written on that I want to find out. Inside this cathedral, there is a written document that has survived for more than 800 years, a piece of history considered to be the first universal recognition of civil rights. I'm talking about Magna Carta. And here it is. And here it is in the tent to protect it from the um, sunlight. Right. Um, it's Magna Carta. Spirit of justice, power of words. That's right. OK, I'm goosebumps. Let's okay, do it. Let's go, on, go shall we? Emily, the cathedral librarian, is ready to reveal oh, Magna Carta's secrets. In all its glory. The importance of that document is, is hard to fathom, really, isn't it? Yes, yes. I mean, just looking at it there, it, it doesn't appear much to look at, but it is really the cornerstone of um, democracy today. So what does it say? This was the very first time that the ideas of freedom for individuals and people being tried by a jury of their peers um, and the king also being subject to the law was actually set down. So before this document then, King John or the monarchy, whatever, would have had absolute power, right? Absolutely. It was called the divine right of kings. Right. So the king was above the law. This document is the sort of start of that idea that the king isn't above the law anymore. And that is the very beginning of the idea of the parliamentary system in England. Wow. Mm. It's incredible to think that it's survived for over 800 years. What is it written on? Well, if you'd like to come outside, I can show you. Yes, please. That'd be great. Thanks. I must say, I really like your office. Yes, it's a beautiful yeah. room. I'm, I'm <laughs> you very lucky. lucky. Thing. So what have we got here, then? Well, here I've got some samples of the sort of material that Mag Magna Carta is written on. Right. Animal skin, sheep skin, was the material that was commonly used throughout the whole medieval period for writing on. Okay. It was very robust material. It was portable. You could fold it up. Makes sense. Um, very easy to use. It's also very long-lasting, very durable. Mm. I mean, that's Magna Carta is 800 years old. Right. Um, and to look at it, you wouldn't think it was as old as that. No. isn't it? Absolutely. Thank you very much for showing me probably the most important document I've ever seen. Take care. Oh, it's been Thank a pleasure. You. Cheers, Emily. Bye-bye. Wow. The Magna Carta really is such an important document. But the truth is, writing on animal skin or writing on metal or wood or stone well, it wasn't practical. You couldn't just whip out to the garden, skin a sheep, and then write your shopping list down on the sheep's back, could you? The world needed something more feasible. The world needed paper. But who invented it? It is now universally acknowledged that paper was invented in 105 AD by a Chinaman called Tsai Lung, who worked in the emperor's court. But there are a few stories around exactly how he invented it. One of them was that he was watching wasps make their nests, and what they do is they chew up twigs and what have you, dissolve it with saliva, and then form it into the shape of their nest. So he thought, ah, I'll do the same thing with bamboos, or in my case, grass. And what he did was he took it, and he put it in his mouth, and he chewed it, you know, made a pulp of it and then stretched it out into some paper. Hmm. Right, dogs have been here. Another legend is that of Tsai Lun. Now, apparently this guy was sitting down by a beautiful river one morning and he saw a lady washing her clothes. Now, these clothes were old and falling to pieces and some of the fibres from these clothes were collecting on the surface. He scooped them out, put them on the side, the sun dried them out and created the first piece of paper. And that piece of paper had a long journey ahead of it. It is thought that the secret of paper making made its way from China into the Arab culture and was finally brought to Europe by the Crusaders returning from the Middle East. And it was in Italy that these Chinese techniques were improved. Fabriano today is a small town in central Italy, but in the 13th century it was one of the most important European locations for paper production. It was here that modern paper was born. Hello. Hello, nice Hi, to ciao. meet you. Nice to meet you, I'm Tim. Tom. Ah, I'm Claudia. You look wonderful in your oh, thank you so blanket much. dress thing. 
Um, so I've come here to make some paper. Yes, but what about the rags? You didn't bring with you rags. Well, oh, yeah, yeah. No, it's rags. not that. Not the new ones, but the old ones. You should go to find the rags. Right. But not dressed in that way. You need the medieval dresses. Nope, I'm not going to a fancy dress party. Yes, this snazzy outfit was donned by the rag and bone man and was a very important job. Rag man! Any old rags? He went around towns and villages collecting old clothes and rags to resell, which were fundamental ingredients for paper making. Right, now that should be enough rags. Now, the truth is, back in the 1630s, this was considered to be a dangerous job. Now, how could it be dangerous? Well, believe it or not, they were smack bang in the middle of the plague. And a way to spread the plague was through old rags like these. But luckily, I'm safe in the 21st century. Let's make paper. I'm yeah. going to discover how paper was made here in Fabriano back in the 13th century. Firstly, the rags were ripped and cut into small pieces. These cuttings were then inserted into this amazing machine, which is called a hydraulic hammer mill. Here, thanks to the power coming from the water wheel, the rags were macerated with water and then beaten in order to make paper paste. Right, so this is the pulp from the paper mill with which we're going to make some paper. Like a weird chicken soup. It's so bizarre to think that this was just like rags and a shirt. Bravo. Oh, yes. I made paper. And there it is. With rags. Yeah. Amazing. But actually, the process is not complete. In fact, the crucial invention from the Fabriano paper makers had yet to come. OK, now he's putting the sheets inside the basin where yeah. there is hot water and animal gelatin, an incredible invention made in Fabriano at the end of the 13th century, to waterproof the sheets to the ink. So it was a game changer, this was then? Yes. It really changed paper for yes. the whole world, right. And then that meant that these things could have important information written on them, so they became worthy of valuable documents. Exactly. Right. That was amazing. Thank you so much. That was great. So, to summarise, what do you need to make medieval paper? Rags. Rags. Water. Water. Wind. Wind. Three things. Please. Thank you so much. Grazie. Ciao. 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 If we had to produce paper using this method today, could you imagine just how many billions of tonnes of rags would be needed? Another invention was necessary to give a revolutionary breakthrough to the fate of paper. Now, by the mid-19th century, the world was in love with paper, but there was a problem. They were running out of rags, and they needed an alternative solution. And that came in 1844, when a German man called Friedrich Keller had a plan, and that was to take trees, chop them up using grindstones into a fine pulp, and produce something that we call today cellulose. This was the final part of the jigsaw for paper. That's right, and I'm talking about this stuff. Wood! Right then, let's make some cellulose, shall we, with the old axe? Yes, please. Right. My axe suddenly looks stupid. That's a proper axe. Don't get me. <laughs> Woman in scary machine. Can I come in? Hi, I'm Tim. Hi. Right, I'm in. Can we do some uh, harvesting? OK. This is so exciting. In the world, there are three trillion trees. Every year, about 10 to 15 billion are extracted by man. Now, I know this may look shocking, but thankfully here in Sweden, forest owners are aware of the danger of deforestation. The one thing that struck me from talking to Emily in the cabin back there is just how much these guys actually respect this environment. You see, these guys are harvesters, and 50 years ago, her grandfather planted these trees. It's a family business. Now, she's planting new trees for her grandkids to harvest in 50 years from now. So it's kind of a, 
It's like they both look after each other. The trees look after them and they look after the trees. Simple as that. But where do these things go next? That's what I want to know. Sodracell in Morham is one of the largest and most modern pulp mills in the world. The perfect place to show off exactly how cellulose is made from trees. The cellulose production starts from the woodyard. A truck full of logs we've just extracted in the forest has arrived at the factory. Perfect timing. Right, my logs. Now this is the beginning part of an exciting journey where these things become cellulose and it all starts with this bad boy here. Oh yes, look at the size of that thing. <laughs> what a pincer. Hello mate, can I come up? That's a whole lot of wood up there, <laughs> half a forest. The trunks are placed into this production line. In this first part of the process, a huge drum removes the bark from the logs. The trunks are then chopped and the result is this mountain of small wood chips. Oh, yes, please. Now, this is what I'm talking about. Look at all this machinery. How cool. Right. Now, we've seen the wood chippings out there. They come into this place and they get cooked. Now, where is one of the things I'm looking for? It's up here. Now, it's called a digester. And what happens is basically the wood chippings sit in that for a while. They all converge at the bottom and they get cooked and cooked and cooked until they separate into two basic products. So you've got cellulose on one side, which is part of the paper making process. I'll show you more about that later on. But on the other side, you've got a product which is used to generate massive amounts of energy. Now, when I say massive amounts of energy, this whole plant, the whole place here, actually produces a whole lot more energy than it uses. Now, to put that in terms of just how much, well, it puts electricity back into the grid, and it also supplies heating for up to 20,000 houses locally. Uh, so a word of advice, if there's ever a power cut, you know what I'm gonna do and come and live here, all right? The result of the digesting process is a paste of soft and fibrous cellulose, which will be washed to remove chemicals and bleached to make it white. This pulp then goes inside a huge drying machine. Here the paste is shaped first into a giant sheet, then gradually cut into smaller ones. And eventually, the final product is ready. Now there it is. That is the finished product. All this entire factory boils down to this, cellulose. And you know what, I tried it in the grass and I'm gonna try it now. So this is in its pure form. And what's amazing about this stuff is that it has absolutely no taste at all. It's a polysaccharide, it's like a starch, which means it's of, um, of no benefit or disadvantage to the human being. We can't metabolize it, it's completely neutral and it doesn't taste at all. They actually use this, well not this stuff, but they use it in the food industry. They use it to puff out food and also give it to, well, dietitians give it to people who are overweight so they make you feel full and it comes out the same way it goes in, which I don't think I need to show you, to be honest. Let's get back to paper. Cellulose is amazing. It really feels like you have the essence of paper in your hands. But you know what I want to do? I want to see what happens to this huge amount of cellulose that's produced here. I want to go to the paper mills. The master paper maker back in Fabriano told me that in order to make paper, you need three key things. You need wind, water, and rags. Well, these days we don't use rags anymore. We use cellulose and green energy, but we still need water and wind. And here on the coast of Wales, we can find plenty of both, making this place a perfect location. 
To see what can be done with cellulose, I've come to a paper mill in Swansea, home of one of the largest European companies in the business, Sofidel. Here in this warehouse, all those sheets of cellulose end up, and I'm here to meet Giuseppe Munari, head of the company's British factories. Thanks, dude. Giuseppe. Hi, Tim. Lovely to see you. How are you doing? Nice to have you here in Wales. I recognise this stuff. Yeah. I know what this is. This stuff here is the pulp. This is the cellulose, right? Yeah. So what do you make with this pulp? Here, in this factory, we make exclusively paper for hygienic and sanitary use. Toilet paper? Of course. Kitchen towels? Of course. Two of the most important things yeah. in my life. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> Genuinely, <laughs> seriously. Everybody's life. I would love to see like a tour of the factory to see how it's made. Go from well, the whole process. Well, follow me and I will try to introduce you. To Thank you very much. Tissue. The paper making process starts with the bales being placed on the conveyor belt and sent to a sort of giant pot where the cellulose is mixed with water and then the solution is refined through a series of rotating blades. Oh, no way! Yeah, yeah. It's like a giant food process. That is so cool. Yeah. Can I jump in? No, 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 <laughs> no, 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 no. All right, we'll close it up. From here, the cellulose gloop is pumped into the main machine, the heart of the paper mill. Wow! What's that? Look at the size of it! I want to own my own one of those one day. I want that in my bedroom. This huge paper machine basically gets the cellulose that has been mixed with water and transforms it into a soft pulp. After the paste enters the machine, the mixture is then drained completely and the result is a giant toilet roll looking thing. Oh, silence, it's noisy yeah, out there. Yeah. Right, so this place is the brain. This is the NASA headquarters of the heart of the paper mill. Right, so what about the water? I mean, there's a huge wastage of water. It is a closed loop. Oh, OK. So whatever is removed Comes goes back, back to the process and right. back again. Like the radiator system in a house? Yes. OK. Exactly. I love this place. Can I? I want, I want to touch it with my hands. I want to feel it. You sure? Maybe kiss it. <laughs> <laughs> can I get a hold? Let's go. Let's OK, go. cool. Right, earplugs back in. It's going to get noisy again. Yeah. It's like a huge, huge toilet roll. Yeah, this one uh, is a basically three tons of paper. Right. Would I use that in my life? You know, in my whole life, would I go through that? I think three lives, probably. <laughs> three lives in there? Yeah, yeah. No way. Yeah. Who'd have guessed that? There's enough toilet paper here for three people. Or just one of my mothers. She uses a lot of that. In this part of the factory, the giant toilet rolls are unwound and laid into plies, embossed, laminated with glue, and finally printed. The toilet roll is now ready. Wow. Look at that. It's hypnotic. It really is. So here are the finished rolls. Yeah. This is what I recognise. Can I take one? Yeah, yeah, of course. That's amazing. I mean, that is today's toilet roll. Yes. What about the toilet roll of tomorrow? The main difference is that uh, this roll has a two and a half time the length of paper than this one. Can I feel? And you can feel that it is Yeah, it's more... a bit heavier, but it's denser, yeah. right? Yes. If we introduce this one uh, in the UK, for example, we could remove from the roads uh, something like 10,000 lorries a year. Oh, really? Delivery? Oh. Right, yeah. much greener. Yeah. Yeah. OK, yeah. you can have that one then. That's good. That's the one I'll keep. I'm going to yeah. test drive that one. <laughs> Thanks to Giuseppe, I'm now a toilet paper expert. But if I want to be a real guru, I must find a toilet on the way out. 
sure there's one around here somewhere. Hello? I've been waiting for you. That's weird. <laughs> Who are you? My name's Richard Smith. I'm a writer and I wrote this book, Bum Fodder, an absorbing history of toilet paper. Nice to meet you. you Let me see this then. So you've written a book called Bum Fodder? Yeah. What's this all about then? Well, it's an absorbing history of toilet paper. But what I've prepared for you today is another view of what the world looked like before toilet paper. If oh, you can really? imagine such a thing. Right, so what people used to use before exactly. toilet paper? Yeah. Okay, cool. So if you'd like to begin in cubicle number one. What's that? You'll have to see. The hell is that? Now this is a xylospongio. Right. In simpler terms, it's a sponge on a stick. This is what the Roman Empire was built on. This is how a, your average Roman would wipe his bum. Is it wet? Do you wet it and then use it? You wet it in vinegar. OK. What? Vinegar? Yeah, pretty much the same stuff you'd put on your chips. That's disgusting. Yeah. Does it work? Work for the Romans. Right. OK, let's move on. Here we go. So who are these guys? So this is the early days of America, as we know it. Right. Early Americans used to use... Come on. <laughs> really? The American settlers found that the corn on the cob, which was a native uh, crop for them, it's not only a delicious snack, yeah. but also wipes its feet on the way out. Have you tried that? Not personally, but I'm okay. assured it's a vigorous alternative. You know your stuff. Right, I'm going for the next one, this one. Oh, this come one. on, this one's a joke, right? It's a bit exotic. I'll no, come on, this is not exotic. It's just absolutely and utterly ridiculous. Come on. Well, this would have been from the Polynesian islands. Well, it's just another example of how wiping your bum used to be a part of your culture. It reflected where you were from. But once again, it gets the job done, and it's reusable. <laughs> it's there just another are. example of how people would use local stuff. Yes. Ah, right. So this one here. Now, makes sense. Um, as soon as paper started being printed cheaply, and you could find it anywhere, it was magazines, it was cheap newspapers, it was brochures, catalogues, yep. whatever. Once you've read it, you pin it up in the outhouse, and you go and do the necessary with it. When did toilet paper come around there? So, in 1857, a New Yorker called Joseph Gaiety, mm. who was one of the great unsung innovators of the 19th century, <laughs> nice. he uh, patented his, his medicated paper. Obviously, you had to pay for it, but your catalogue was free, so why would anyone do this? Right. So, Joseph Gaiety's brainwave, his marketing genius, was to say, well, this isn't just a cleaning product, this isn't just some paper, this is medicine. This is necessary for you. Because, he said, printer's ink causes hemorrhoids. Gives you terrible piles, which is nonsense. Clever. But it put people off yeah. using the magazines, because okay. nobody wants that. It's amazing how much stuff you know about this. It's frightening. I know, you're married. <laughs> well done. Amazingly, I am. <laughs> it's a well done, amazing fact. Right, can I borrow? There's something I want to borrow here. Not that one, but I think I know exactly what I can do uh, with these. Nice to meet you. You too. OK, I'll turn the lights off on the way out. The history of toilet paper is fascinating, particularly when you know what people used to struggle to use. I mean, that there is taken for granted. But that is an incredible invention that should be celebrated with, I don't know, with a national holiday or something. So how do we kickstart a national holiday to celebrate toilet paper? Well, the best way to do it is probably to remind them of what they used to have to use. I need you to ask you a question about these. How are you doing? You all right? These three things here, right, were used before the invention of... Any ideas? Any ideas? What do you think they're for? What do you reckon these are, then? Any ideas? Not a clue. Wiping what, you, you... your... Yeah, wiping <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> wipe your... I won't see it. Which of the three will you try for me today? Um, I'll pass. So can you take that to the toilet and then give it a go? Uh, I'd rather not, to be honest, though. Do you want to try it? No. Are you serious? Which one do you want to try? None of them. Nah. <laughs> Whip down there, give it a go, come back and tell me what it's like. No. You can keep it. We have one, two or three, so which is your number today? It'd have to be number one. Do you want to give it a go? Yeah, I could do. Yeah. Excellent. All right, yeah. I'll see you. I'll, wait, I'll wait here for you. Yeah. OK, see you in what, like five minutes? How long? Five minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes. OK, all right, thanks, dude. Thank you. You've got to love the Welsh. Who'd have thought that toilet paper was so interesting, eh? But I'll tell you something you didn't expect to hear. Paper has changed our lives, not only in the intimacy of a toilet, but also in the vastness of the sky. Mm. 
Now, believe it or not, paper actually taught us how to fly. Let me show you this. You might recognize it. Yep, the Chinese lantern. Now, I admit I am rubbish at making these things go up, but let's give it a shot, eh? Now, I have to be honest here, this is the first time if this one goes up that I've ever managed to make one fly. And I'm in Italy and it's a hot day, so if I set fire to this field, don't tell anyone. But I'm desperate to show you the principles of how these things work. It's very simple. Basically, if you look at it this way, we are at the bottom of an ocean of air. It's quite dense air down here, and when you heat air up, it becomes less dense. And what do less dense things want to do? They tend to rise to the top, which is why these things fly. OK, well... Well, there we are, as you can see, a huge success, the Chinese lantern, lit by an Englishman. I think that's the problem there. There is, in fact, a far more impressive way of flying with paper, and maybe I should show you that before I burn down a large part of this beautiful landscape here in Italy. I'll put that out. The first human flight used exactly the same principles as the Chinese lantern, and believe it or not, we are still using those same simple principles today. Thank you. This is very exciting. I'm too heavy for this, I think. <laughs> too much cake. This beautiful invention was actually invented over two centuries ago by Jacques and Joseph Montgolfier. And what has that got to do with paper? Believe it or not, if you want to know what they did, they were paper makers. And apparently, legend has it that one of them was watching a bit of paper, a bit of lit paper hovering above a fire and went, hang on a minute, I've got an idea, which turned into this thing. This beautiful landscape here is in Tuscany, it's Lucca. And back in 1300, this place was absolutely crammed with paper mills. So why did they choose to build them here? Well, to make paper, you need lots of things, but two very important things are water and wind. And this place has an abundance of both. Of all the different sorts of paper produced in this area, there is one specific product I want to talk to you about. A product that sometimes is completely taken for granted and underestimated, however fundamental to our health. Wow, look at the size of this place. The truth is, this Sofidel factory here in Lucca in Italy probably wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the invention of that thing there. It's called a nose, and I think you've got one on the end of your face. Now, every now and again, you catch a cold, they run. And what do you reach for? You reach for one of those, the good old tissue. And this place here can make 16,000 of those every single minute. Wow. Toilet paper wasn't the only revolution brought about in terms of health. It also started a revolution in terms of tissues for your nose. Take my dad, for example. Material handkerchief, blows his nose in his pocket. Not many people know this. Don't use those things, throw them away. Your hands and your pockets will be full of bacteria. Oh, and if you don't take it from me, uh, maybe you'll take it from the World Health Organization. Yes, they recommend the use of this stuff. That's right, good old tissue paper to prevent a breakout of influenza. And if you're really stubborn, well, the University of Westminster, they carried out some research and they said this stuff reduces the buildup of bacteria on your hands and on your and on your TV screen. Come on. Now, talking of tissues, there's a guy I really want to meet here in Tuscany, a guy called Silvio, and he is the world record holder for the largest collection of handy tissues on the planet. I must confess I'm moderately curious about this one. Hi. Hi. Silvio, how are you doing? Hi. <laughs> I'm Tim. Lovely to meet you. Come with me. Thank you. Right. So, uh, this is oh. my... Guinness World Records certificate. Wow, and you had 12,554 in uh, May 2013. Yeah, yeah. How many do you have now? Now I have about uh, 15,322 different. Still going? Yeah, yeah. Still collecting? Great, that's brilliant. Uh, uh, come, come to me. Thank you very much. Uh, sit down. Um, so I show to you my collection. Okay, I'm very excited. Can't wait to see you. Thank you. 
I've got to be honest, I was expecting his house to be absolutely crammed with these tissues, but where on earth are they? all of them? No, I have uh, four times more. Four times more? Yeah. Okay, <laughs> you see, here's what I want to know. Um, was it just a, a, an easy way to get into the Guinness Book of World Records? Because, you know what, I could collect toenails <laughs> and have a certificate, maybe. Is it an illness? Eh, uh, maybe. <laughs> for Do you know what, this is proof that whatever your head can think up, there is somebody on the planet doing it. 15,000 different packets, that's incredible. Thank you so much for showing me. It's been enlightening. Cheers, I know where to come if I have a cold. I've seen how paper was invented, how it is produced, and how it was used to improve our health. But I'm missing a crucial part of its journey. I'm in Mainz, a city of ancient Roman origins. Now here, back in the mid 15th century, something kick-started the age of mass media. Let me show you exactly what I'm talking about. Isn't it astounding to think that almost 700 million of these things are printed every single day around the world and read by almost a third of the world's population? But do you know what? It hasn't always been that way. In this city, one of the single most important inventions in the history of mankind was born. Movable type printing. And that's all thanks to one man. This guy, eyeballing you, Johannes Gutenberg. Before movable type printing, books were uncommon and exceedingly expensive. To print one book, you had to hand carve each page from a solid block of wood. Right, where, ah, yes. Now that is what I'm looking to see. So that is an example of a block that would print one page of a block book. I mean, to get this into perspective, imagine printing a whole book. Right, so that is an individual carving, and albeit it's of playing cards or something like that, it would be one per page. Now, if you've got 400 pages in a book, you would have to carve 400 of those. And imagine if there was a spelling mistake. So the hell that used to go into printing just one book is unimaginable. But let me see if I can find what it was that killed those. Just like that. Wow, look at that. That is the Gutenberg Press. I'm not joking when I say this, that thing is as important to the world as the invention of the wheel. I shouldn't be doing this, but you know what? It's a once in a lifetime opportunity. Now that is just one letter, but Gutenberg didn't stop with one letter. He made over 290 of them, and what can you do with 290 different letters, well, you can assemble them in any shape you want to make whatever words you want in the dictionary. And that is what was so revolutionary about this. It would take a day to change a page. This had never been seen before. And I say, we print a page. Catch my drift, hang on. between 1450 and 1500. Thanks to the Gutenberg Press and what followed afterwards, more books were printed than had ever been made in the previous millennia. And look at that. That, my friends, is a work of art. 
to give you an idea of just how important this machine was, it's similar to the birth of the internet. This was the first media revolution. Movable type printing has also tremendously stimulated the demand for paper production. You see, the easier it became to print, the more paper was needed to disseminate knowledge. We can truly say the Gutenberg invention meant that culture and information were no longer for the privileged few, but for the first time, for everybody. Do you know, as I leave this place, I'm consumed with this feeling of debt and gratitude to not just Gutenberg, but also to paper, at just how much we owe both of them in terms of who we are today. It's amazing. I'm almost at the end of my fascinating journey. And during this trip, I've learned that paper has a strong bond with the environment. However, some people might think that paper producers are just exploiting what Mother Earth has given us in terms of energy, water and trees. So I've come to this place in Sweden where new forests are constantly created to meet two experts and find out exactly what kind of future paper really has. Two ladies in a forest. This is a dream, isn't it? <laughs> Lovely to meet you. I'm Tim. How are you doing? Hi. Nice to meet you. Hi. Uh, hi Okay, so let me guess, right, uh, making a new forest. Yes, I'm planting a tree, a spruce tree. Is that what baby trees look like? Yes, look at that. Yes, it is. Looks like a brown carrot or something. <laughs> this... Now, but in 20 years, they will be big and this will be a huge forest. Like this one back here? Yes, exactly. Uh, you guys, uh, look, you're the WWF, right? Yes. What are you guys doing here? We make sure that this forest is managed in a sustainable way. Management of forests? Yes, exactly. <laughs> Is he a forest manager? He is. <laughs> <laughs> right, okay, so this guy is basically the boss of these boys yes. here. Yeah. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No way. Okay, so he protects them and makes sure that they're looked after and whatever. All they that make sort of sure stuff. that biodiversity animals are also protected right. in the forest. I'm being very careful with your little baby trees here. I'm going to put it down, he's a scary man. Okay, so you are, right, you're Sofidel. We are Sofidel. You're the guys that make the paper. So you use this stuff, so how come you're here? Kind of like... <laughs> we are so conscious of the importance of the plant and of the forest, and we are very much committed in uh, sustainability. So in terms of a boxing match, you're not on opposite sides, you're on the same side? We are working no together. Yeah. That's great. Amazing, Fight the Do you know what? For my head, that's really good to hear that. That's really nice to hear that. So this is going to be a new forest? Yes. Right. Now, I have used quite a bit of paper. I love paper, right? And on the last couple of weeks on my journey, I've used paper for train tickets, a bus tickets, my diary, toilet tissue. So I feel like I've used a whole tree. So I'd like to do my bit. I'd like to take a tree and I would like to plant it. Yes, please do it. Thank but you. you should plant at least three of them. Why is that? <laughs> because you are in a certified place. And this is a rule. It's a rule, yes. is it? For trees. each tree, you have to plant so that's three. the deal you guys have. That's really cool. Okay, so use one tree, plant three. Yeah. Okay, well, cool. Well, I'm going to show off. One, <laughs> two, three. <clears throat> Four. All right. Thank you, girls. I'll go and plant these ones. Cheers. All right. This is the place. In you go. Thanks to places like this, we'll be able to use paper every day without any worries. You see, paper is part of a sustainable and eco-friendly process. You know what? I'm proud of paper. So trees are not disappearing and paper isn't either. On the contrary, it still has a fundamental role in all of our lives. We need paper everywhere, in our houses, in the streets, and in our jobs. We put our emotions on paper. We write on paper. We use it to store our food. We still use it to buy things, for our personal hygiene, for our knowledge, and to be constantly informed. We use paper in countless ways every single day. No, a paperless world is unconceivable. And at the end of this long journey, I can affirm my stand for paper was completely right. A world without paper would be a sad place to be. Do you know what? 
Without paper, we wouldn't be who we are today. We would certainly be a whole lot more dirty, more ignorant, and have a whole lot less freedom.